Welcome to a new chapter on my Porsche 911 restoration project. It's finally engine time. Well, sorta. Let me explain. Garage time. Okay, I have an engine sitting right over there in the corner of my garage, but before I show it to you, just wanna summarize, you know, where we've come on this car. You know, if you've watched this for a while, you'll know that there's a lot of performance enhancements on this car. You know, it's got better suspension, it has the roll cage, it has, you know, bigger brakes, it has the, you know, competition level fuel system. You know, it has a lot of chassis strengthening features. A lot of performance and tunability was built into this car as a platform but it was also built with a budget. And the budget goal has always been $10,000, including the price of the car for a driver. That's phase one. Phase two is to keep evolving, evolving, evolving out to like phase X. So I intend to really push this car as far as I can, but to get it started, that's where this engine comes in. And I've said this before, but this is an engine that is sort of temporary. I intend to put this 912 engine in my 911, which is kind of unheard of. So here's the deal with this engine. This engine I purchased like 10 years ago for $1,500 and it is partially rebuilt. Yes, there's definitely concerns with this engine. I know that the heads are not done. They're just sitting on here at the moment. But the bottom end, the crank, the rods, the cam, the lifters, all the uh, pistons are supposed to be new and good to go. But it's been in storage and I have some concerns. So we're gonna be going through and doing some health checks on the bottom end today. Find out what's needed and if it is worth moving forward on this engine. It should be okay, but I don't wanna just chance it. So if you're interested in engines, the next few sessions on this YouTube show will be about the setting up the compression ratio, measuring the piston to head clearance, verifying that the rocker arm geometry is correct. I might check the cam timing. We'll be going through sort of the top end, but like I said, I'm not gonna spend time on this engine if the bottom end is junk. Okay, one of the first things to check on this engine before I crank it over, I've got it set, set up on my engine stand to crank it, and I wanna check the end play of the flywheel, make sure that it's not too tight, and I don't wanna cause any damage to the bearings. This is something that the builder should have set up, but I'm gonna verify the end play before I go too far cranking. This, by the way, is my own product. You may have seen these by Zalix Industries. Well, Zalix Industries is me. I have created these for the last sort of 10 to 12 years. We also make this control box for exactly what we're doing today, the engine test stand and troubleshooting old engines, figuring out how to diagnose them and make them run better. It's so much easier to work on these engines outside of the car. And that's what we do. So I'm gonna be showing how this works as we crank through some of these things. If you are a customer already, thank you so much. If you have a problem with any of our products, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I don't care how old it is, we always take care of our customers. And if you're interested in becoming a customer, obviously reach out to me again. We're happy to um, give you some information on this stuff. It's by zalexindustries.com and you can reach me there, of course. One of the important measurements on these engines, if you want it to last at all, is the end play of the flywheel. That is the definition of how far the crankshaft is allowed to slip fore and aft. And it's gotta be between like five, or I think it's four and eight thousandths of an inch. Five or seven thousandths is better. And I'm gonna measure it with this dial indicator. I'm gonna set it up on a magnetic base on this engine stand, find out what it is. Now this is, pretty temporary too, because you guys know that 912 engines aren't exactly designed to go with the 915 transaxle. I do have a 915 transaxle in storage, so I'm gonna have to switch the flywheel in order for it to work with the 915. The differences are the clutches. Uh, one's a pull style clutch, the other's a push style clutch. So this flywheel is gonna get removed eventually, and it will have to be re-shimmed. But before I even 
crank this engine, I want to make sure this is at least close so I don't cause any more damage to that rear bearing. This magnetic base should attach here to the engine stand. And that should do it right there. Okay, it might be hard to see, but I'm just using a screwdriver to look at the movement of the needle when it's all the way pushed to the rear of the car. That's a number of 76. And then I push it to the front. I get 80, 75. 82. It's a little dark back here, but I, I have this attached to some steel. And then the indicator is right down inside here. Right there is where it touches the flywheel. So when I reach underneath here and pry with the screwdriver, the needle goes from there, it's kind of a shadow on there, to there. See the, see the jump in the needle? From there to there. And I'm getting about anywhere between four to seven thousandths, depending on where I pry with the screwdriver. So that is close enough to at least crank it over. As I said before, these heads have not been done. In fact, these are some spare heads. I have another set of heads from a running car that I might be able to go through quickly and just get this bolted up. These barrels are pretty loose, so I'm going to use some, some spacers and some nuts to make sure they don't just fall off. Here's the spacers I put on with a little nut on the stud just to prevent these barrels from sliding off. The pistons look like they've never been used. You can still see some numbers on them. And luckily, the cylinder bores are still really clean. They've been coated in oil for a long time. So there's, the, you can see some cross hatching in there where they've been honed. Okay, these, these cast iron barrels are kind of a dead giveaway that it's an aftermarket big bore kit. And yeah, 80, 86 millimeter bore. So that is the 1720cc, um, should be fine trying to keep this all really clean. I've rigged up some temporary stuff over here too to see if we can generate some oil pressure. Now this is where the stock oil cooler goes. This is a bypass system just looped to itself to keep oil flowing into the main bearings. I have the stock oil cooler. I have all the stock parts for this engine all the way from the generator out to the mufflers. This is the correct distributor, although it looks like it needs to be rebuilt. It's got some corrosion in here. It has, it's been stored without the cap on it. So I have more distributors. I can swap this one out, but um, this one is the original. Inside here is where it starts to get a little sketchy. Okay, the sump cover has been removed and inside, it, it doesn't look particularly clean in there. Like, you know, if I was rebuilding this engine, I would have it sort of sparkling inside. But there is some old, you know, old dinginess to the aluminum. Probably not the end of the world, but the one thing that does have me concerned is you can see this is the cam right here. And it has some assembly lube on it, but that lube has kind of gotten really stiff and dry. Assembly lube is normally a good thing on a new engine because especially the camshaft, you want to have some protection that is going to break in the new lifters with the new cam. In this case, I'm a little worried about the condition of the assembly lube. So I've reached inside and I've tried to clean some of it off. It's, it's like kind of old grease is what it comes down to right now. 
And I'm also worried they probably use the same assembly lube on the crankshaft and the cam bearings. So my idea now, because it's been so long, is to run some oil through the engine and determine if I can push all that old assembly lube out. I'm not gonna be able to reapply it on the crankshaft because I don't intend to split the case, but I can reapply it to the camshaft because the camshaft is reachable from the sump plate. Another thing that I've already done and forgot to hit record, I took the oil pump apart and looked at the condition of the oil pump gear and also the cam. It looks like the drive tang on the oil pump is in great condition. Normally these wear a lot. And also the cam, it can peek inside there. The cam looks like it is not worn. So that's a good sign. I also did the straight edge across the pump housing and measured the end play of the oil pump. It is all within specifications. So fingers crossed so far this engine rebuild, at least the portions that I can look at, looks like it's been done correctly. I've never seen this done before, but I am going to crank this engine over upside down and supply it with fresh oil. I don't want it to pick up any debris, so I'm going to pour oil directly into the oil pump, fresh oil, brand new oil, and let that circulate through and monitor this gauge down here to see if we can build some oil pressure. We should be able to get at least 10 to 20 pounds of oil pressure just with the starter motor. There is no forces anywhere on the journals, not on the rod journals, not on the cam journals. Everything should be spinning very freely. And I can move this engine over by hand really easily. It feels really free as I move it over by hand. And see the pistons are moving. I'm only using my thumb to spin this. Now the rings are not on these pistons. The pistons are just sliding in the bore, so it's really easy to spin this. There's no binding whatsoever in the crank or the cam or the cam gear or the oil pump, nothing like that. I've already connected a battery to the starter with some heavy jumper cables. And now I'm giving it some fresh oil. Okay. So this should be set up to crank. And I don't know if you can see the gauge here, but I'm keeping my eye on the gauge. Now, I think it's going to go through this pretty quickly. But let's see. So I'm going to have to pour oil in it continuously because it's sucking the oil in quick. So far, no oil pressure. There we go. That up well, that went to almost 20 psi. Okay, that's going all the it's going up to 30 psi. That's kind of a lot. going all the way past 30 PSI. We got a little bit of oil coming out the filler hole, which is to be expected. So let me just pump it all through and we'll drain it out the bottom. Okay, the engine's slowing down a little bit. Let me check the voltage, because I have a really weak battery. I'm down to 12 volts on the battery, so I started at 13.5, so I think that's why it's cranking a little slower. The engine still moves really freely by hand.
Okay, all out of oil. You can see a lot of oil coming out the filler neck right here. I did have a rag in it, but it just pushed the rag out with the weight of the oil, it looks like. So you can see the oil looks pretty clean, but it's a little milky. I think the assembly lube did come through. Hopefully it all came out, but the oil's coming out nice and clean. I kind of thought I'd get more oil coming out of this guy here. This is, doesn't have the pulley on it, so this seal isn't cut, touching anything, but no oil came out this number four bearing. Hopefully it's not clogged or anything. Lots of oil splashing around in here. This, all these cavities in here are full. See the pickup tube still has a little bit of oil in it, but everything got circulated around a little bit. Oil coming out of the pistons a little bit. The barrels are still tight. This control box has a little magnet on the back, so it sticks right to the stand when you're not using it. Try to catch as much of the oil as we can. Need two hands to spin it. Okay, most of the oil looks like it went right out the top of the engine. Let's see here. Oh, there's a bunch more. Yeah, it's coming out pretty clean. Let me do one more thing. I'm gonna catch a little bit of the oil in a Dixie cup, see how dirty it is. I suspect it'll be pretty clean. Yeah, the oil, you know, looks okay. It does have some bubbles in it. Right now it's still fresh out of the engine. You can see some bubbles in there, but I'm not seeing any debris. Let me pour some out. Looks like there's a little bit of dirt in there. Probably, you know, some of that chunky part of the assembly lube or maybe just some dirt in the cleaning process. I think when you have a brand new engine, some dirt is, is somewhat normal, um, but you wanna get that out right away. So I'm gonna keep running this process until all the dirt is gone. So I created a oil filter. Man, it's hot today. It's already summertime, I guess. Oh. So right behind me is the oil filter. So this is just a large drainage pipe. I cleaned it out. At the bottom of it is a roll of toilet paper. And it's got the center of it plugged and the oil just flows through the, the paper and goes right back into a clean bottle. Let me show you. So there's the long tube. Right about down here is where the toilet paper is. And then it's off of this cap just a little bit. The cap is screwed onto it and it just drips out into this container. So I might be overkilling the oiling a little bit, but it's not my engine rebuild. And I am concerned about how it was transported through all kinds of places and how it was taken care of when it was rebuilt. So this is a little bit of insurance, peace of mind, trying to roll fresh oil only one time through the bearings. The oil goes right into the oil pump, right into the bearings, splashes around, pours directly out. It goes to the bearings once. Then I'm putting it in this tube and it's getting cleaned again. The toilet paper is pretty thorough. It takes all night for this oil to filter through. I think it's good enough to go back through the bearings again and then flush out whatever might be old in there or not cleaned well in the first place. The engine doesn't look that clean on the inside, but fingers crossed, it's gonna run okay. Next week, I'll tackle the heads and the piston, make sure they're compatible, set up the compression ratio and all that fun stuff. If you haven't already subscribed, hit the bell notification, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any episodes. I am doing a few weekday episodes now and then, with sort of summary content that is focused on a start to finish outcome for those of you that might be searching for things like roll bar, for instance, I did one last week. So that's it guys, take care, see you next week.